Okay, um, I would like to thank Gerald again for this opportunity to uh, host and of course Park AFM uh, for uh, this opportunity to have a series called 101 series uh, that focuses on tutorials to very important topic. Topic. So I would, uh, well, first of all, good morning, uh, good afternoon, good evening to all of you. Uh, I'm going to talk to you about surface and interfacial phenomena 101. And I will try to compact, uh, put as much as I can within our one hour or the, the, the time that's been allotted to us. This is a very broad topic, very interesting, but uh, obviously I will not be able to cover all in and hopefully give you enough to uh, digest and to appreciate this uh, brief on surface and interfacial phenomena. So I'm with Case Western Reserve University. I'm a professor at, uh, at uh, the Macromolecular Science and Engineering Department. Uh, this is where we are located at Kent Hale Smith Building, uh, my group. Uh, my office is at the fifth floor. And uh, we also have a center called PetroCase uh, that deals with polymers and materials for energy and transformative research in oil and gas. Be happy to explain to you more about our uh, center. Now, uh, my group is primarily focused on materials, polymers and uh, nanomaterials and interfacial phenomena. So this is a very appropriate topic, uh, one that I'm very interested to uh, cover. Uh, today. And uh, we focus on uh, interfacial chemistry, grafting, patterning, uh, nanostructuring at surfaces, and uh, we are able to manipulate them using surface sensitive probe microscopy methods such as the use of the AFM. Uh, in particular, we have a uh, NX10 Park AFM that we have been using very well. Uh, for a lot of our important projects. Now I do uh, uh, work with uh, a number of companies, as you see here, uh, dealing with not only uh, academic uh, pursuits, but different types of uh, problems related to the industry, whether it's product development or sol solving very important problems. So in a way, we translate the basic platform, the best that we can uh, have in a university, all the way to the market needs. And that is uh, up basically applied research where we want to meet uh, very cost effective and cost performance ratio. So today I am going to cover interfacial phenomena. I'm going to cover concepts ba uh, based on this topic, surface tension, uh, Young's equation, capillary action, surfactants, critical micelle concentration, Langmuir bludgeon films, detergency, polymer, polymer uh, surfactants, and a lot of the stuff I cannot cover, and I apologize for this, whether it's high vacuum, uh, solid state, instrumentation, catalysis, ultra thin films. These are very interesting topics, and uh, they touch on interfacial phenomena, surface science as well, and unfortunately, uh, this is not going to be the focus for today. So uh, I'd be happy to do this uh, in the future, but today we're, we'll focus more on interfacial phenomena between uh, different phases, uh, specifically talking about liquid to air, liquid, liquid, solid to liquid uh, interfacial phenomena. So let's start with surface tension. A very basic definition is the ability to uh, for molecules to have cohesive and adhesive forces. Cohesive forces represents interaction between similar molecules, that is bulk phenomena. On the other hand, adhesive forces refers to interaction between two uh, different uh, molecules or two different phases. And that results in a tension, a surface tension between those two phases, uh, which is the origin, for example, of uh, uh, adhesive uh, phenomena. Um, so here, a surface tension basically uh, allows one to appreciate the spreading, the wetting, uh, the various addition for forces between two phases. And it can be represented by units of dynes per centimeter or ergs per centimeter square. 
And usually this value or the surface tension values is specified for specific um, temperatures as well. So surface tension can be found uh, inside a capillary tube between bubbles or droplets or even the uh, phenomena of breathing. And you can see here that the value of, let's say, 73 dynes per centimeter for water is um, uh, quite high, actually. Uh, and intense water, for example, is characterized by what we call high surface energy. On the other hand, uh, surfaces like Teflon, uh, which have low values, are uh, low surface energy surfaces. Now, surface tension in water does change with temperature. As you can see here at ambient uh, temperature, more or less the value of uh, water is about 72 dynes per centimeter. And then as the water temperature increases, that surface tension decreases. It has to arise from the interaction between the polar nature of water and the other phase, which uh, then represents air, or other nonpolar surfaces uh, such as plastic. Thus, surface tension is decreased when you heat up water and a surfactant, and thus a lot of detergency or a lot of cleaning is aided by heating. Now, the bubble of two surfaces is another way to represent surface tension without going too much on the equation. That surface tension, for example, is governed by the Laplace law, which re refers to the radius of a bubble and the difference uh, between uh, two uh, values as you increase or decrease the pressure. Now, practically, if we observe nature, we will observe the effect of surface tension on a lotus leaf, an insect strider, a bird wing, and so on. That is, uh, the surface tension actually is a combination of surface energy and the action of the roughness, the morphology, as well as uh, multi-phases that are, for example, trapped between two phases, such as air, that are trapped in very rough surfaces. Uh, another way to measure surface tension is by using a capillary rise experiment. Here we can see that the surface tension is a function of the density of the liquid, the height that it travels in a tube, uh, and the effect of gravity. So, for example, surface tension actually can be measured by other methods, including the Cecil drop method, the Wilhelmine method, and so on. Uh, you can see that adhesion and surface tension uh, are obvious when it comes to capillary action in a narrow tube. Another manifestation of the surface tension is by direct measurement using contact angle values. The contact angle value is measured between the surface tension of water or liquid and air, liquid and substrate, and substrate and air. That basically represents three types of surface tension between the three phases in a droplet of uh, liquid on a surface. This is governed by, by the famous Young's equation, which is given here, uh, defined as the cosine theta of the droplet. And uh, the uh, surface tension then can be calculated based on this relationship. Thus, the contact angle is a quite, quite a convenient, if not uh, a very commonly used uh, way of measuring wetting or a surface energy between a substrate, uh, a droplet, and air. As you can see here, surface tension, again, does change with the polarity of the surface or the liquid. So for example, the surface tension values as shown in this table uh, represent what we call uh, low energy surfaces. That is values anywhere from six to uh, 31, for example, millinewtons per meter, represents that of uh, surfaces like polyethylene or liquids such as uh, hexatricontane or Teflon or the addition of uh, perfluorinated surfactants on platinum. 
However, uh, as I mentioned er earlier, water, for example, is a high surface tension liquid. So that's the value of 72 or 73 represents the highest value you can get on a surface tension with water. This is usually measured using a contact angle veniometer where the illumination of light uh, and the droplet uh, contact angle is formed, is recorded, or using an algorithm automatically calculated. Well, some surfaces do not wet very well. Some surfaces are, in fact, what we call super hydrophobic. That is because the Young's equation can be corrected or can exhibit correction factors based on the roughness as well as the presence of trapped air uh, between surface features. So for example, the Wenzel correction corrects for the surface area that is based on the geometry changes of a rough surface. On the other hand, a Cassie and Baxter approach calculates not only the correction factor based on the roughness, but also on the fraction of the solid not wetted by the liquid due to trapped air. In fact, the Cassie-Baxter phenomena has been used very widely in the creation of what we call super hydrophobic surfaces uh, that is uh, in nature, whether it's the insect stride or the leaf of a lotus leaf, actually exhibits what we call a Cassie-Baxter wetting phenomena. Now, in general, we can talk about surfactants, referring to molecules that are dual in nature or they are what we call amphiphilic. It contains a hydrophobic part, a hydrophilic part. The hydrophilic part can further be classified based on uh, the presence of anionic, cationic, or even sweeter ionic groups such as betaine, or even non-ionic neutral groups. The surfactant is able to uh, wet uh, is, uh, enable the formation of micelle, detergency, stabilization of emulsion, uh, reactive uh, polymerization, and so on because of its amphiphilic behavior. And the hydrophobic part, for example, can be short or long, or it can even be polymeric. And in relation to the hydrophilic part, uh, a value can be collect, calculated uh, such as called the HLB, or the hydro-lipophilic balance, predicting its behavior in wetting or micellization. So here's an example of several commercially available uh, and important surfactants, uh, SDS, LDAO, CTAB, uh, other types of uh, cholesterate uh, um, surfactants, uh, these are widely used in a number of formulated products, including soap, detergent, shampoo, uh, cleaners, uh, etc. And thus, the HLB, for example, represents the ratio between the hydrophobic part and the hydrophilic part of these various surfactants. Now, the surfactants then are what we call anisotropic uh, molecules, and that is they orient with respect to the phase or environment in an interface. For example, at the air-water interface, and we will cover language blood films, the surfactant uh, nonpolar uh, alkyl chains tend to orient towards air, and the hydrophilic uh, um, head groups tend to orient inside water. In a solution environment, they tend to form aggregates uh, where the majority phase is water, the hydrophobic parts tend to cluster or bury itself inside or the interior of a micelle, exposing the head groups that are hydrophilic towards the uh, outside or majority phase. And the reverse of that, of course, is when the hydrophobic part is exposed to the outer surface, except that the majority phase would then be nonpolar or hydrophobic or other organic solvents. Now, micellization, as you see here, is basically a dynamic aggregate of surfactants that are able to form different types of uh, uh, interfacial uh, objects or assemblies that then graduate from uh, 
micellar to lamellar to liquid crystalline phase all the way to bicontinuous phases. That is, the, it is an equilibrium between unimers that are present or by itself in the majority matrix tending to aggregate to form this globular or spherical-like structure as observed here. Now, the determination of that critical concentration called the critical micell concentration uh, can be determined by a number of ways, uh, including conductivity, light scattering, um, different types of uh, uh, what we call uh, inflection point experiments where you have a dramatic change in that property with respect to a critical point or a critical concentration such as the CMC. Uh, CMCs uh, tend to be in the values of uh, 10 to the uh, minus uh, 4, minus 5 to minus 10 range of millimolar quantities or concentration depending on the surfactant design. But at any rate, the CMC is an important value to determine because this enables one to put the right micelle or determine the right concentration by which micellar phenomena occurs. So the CMC is essentially a property jump or pro property uh, slope change or inflection point as a result of that transition from unimer to micellar structure. Now, micelles, of course, are dynamic, and I uh, emphasized that at the beginning. Unless they are polymerized, the micelle uh, represents the exchange between the free surfactant molecules and the aggregated micelles. This comes to a point where uh, the uh, unimer starts to assembly. On the other hand, uh, increasing amounts of concentration would result to different types of uh, structures or even nanostructures that can resemble lamellar, double layer, or even um, uh, worm-like micelles or vesicular in nature. So for example, this is represented by these structures uh, where the head groups can be part uh, and exposed to the surface uh, in a majority water phase. Uh, on the other hand, in an organic solvent, it becomes inverted. In fact, the easiest thing to uh, recognize the action of surfactants is, of course, in cell membranes or lipid bilayers, uh, commonly associated with transport or biological transport. Now, the micelles can actually be predicted in terms of their geometry by taking into account the volume as influenced by the head group area, the alkyl chain, and the, uh, uh, their assembly. So one can, for example, determine what we call the CPC or critical packing parameter that takes into account the volume, the length, uh, and the area occupied by the head group. Uh, micellar shapes, of course, then becomes predictable based on this ratio, uh, V, volume over area of the head group and length of the alkyl chain. So that a surfactant, uh, whether it's single, double, or rigid bulky head uh, group, uh, as well as alkyl chain, will result, for example, to spherical, cylindrical, vesicular, or uh, inverted micelles. And this probably represents, this table represents a visual um, differentiation of that critical packing parameter as shown here, resulting in these various shapes. Now, higher ordered micelles essentially comes about because of increasing concentration of the surfactant, as well as the reversal of the micellar behavior which changes in the majority phase of the liquid. Uh, in other words, uh, increasing the concentration results in these various uh, um, arrangements and actually affects the viscosity behavior such that you get a dramatic increase in viscosity with increasing temporary uh, concentration representing the prevalence of these higher ordered structures. 
Now uh, we were going to, we're going to be talking in length about emotions. Emotions are different from my cells. Emotion basically is the presence of water, oil, and a surfactant mixed together. For example, milk is a emulsion. Crude oil is an emulsion. Uh, different types of shampoo formulations are emulsions. That is an emulsion is basically a stabilized liquid in which the surfactant plays an important role in compatibilizing these two incompatible liquids, water and oil. Uh, and this can be based on the size of the emulsion. You have micro, mini, and even nano emulsion. Uh, and the question really is stability. How long do these emulsions uh, remain stable over a period of time pressure or even uh, um, volume. Now, microemulsions are, of course, important industrially because that allows you to create very stable products with longer shelf lives. And they are important in changing the viscosity of liquids. Uh, things that are used, for example, in the oil and gas production industry relies a lot on emulsions as well as the use of emulsion, again, in personal care products such as shampoo, lotion, uh, or even the food industry such as uh, mayonnaise, uh, a salad dressing, or um, things like uh, uh, meat emulsions that are used for making sausages. So as you can see here, emulsion can be reversed depending on the majority phase. The water droplet can be inside, or you can have an oil droplet inside, and that reverses the position of the surfactant. Now, with higher ordered emulsions, uh, you essentially have the same trend that is from micellar type, uh, not micellar type, but rather uh, a single layer or bilayer or lamellae uh, structure or even uh, onion-like structures, which is classified as spherulitic. And then eventually, as you go to what we call a 50-50 composition uh, between the oil and water, it forms what we call a bicontinuous phase. The bicontinuous phase represents uh, a more stable phase when you have almost the same amount of oil and water matrix in your emulsion. Now, we need to talk about liquid crystalline phases. Uh, typically, a liquid crystalline phase is where you have either positional or uh, uh, orientational order, but not both. If you have both, that will be what we call solid state crystals. So in what we call lyotropic liquid crystals, the uh, assemblies form higher ordered structures and since they are based in on solution or solubilization, it's called lyotropic. Nevertheless, this lyotropic liquid crystal can result in birefringent optical phases, different types of X-ray scattering uh, and diffraction periodicities or orientation uh, at various uh, emissible phases. And this liquid crystal phases, for example, uh, can also be observed in a bilayer as, as also with monolayer phases such as Langmuir blood films. Uh, in fact, you can create a phase diagram that results in a um, correspondence between the concentration of the, of the amphibolic molecules and its stability uh, with temperature. Uh, this type of phase diagram, interestingly, you can uh, refer to a craft temperature, a boundary condition in which the liquid crystalline uh, phase exists in the three phases. And again, a more complex uh, or complete schematic phase diagram of an oil, water, and amphiphilic uh, mixture uh, that is a phase diagram for uh, an emulsion. Now, are they real? Yes, they are. In fact, you can use transmission electron microscopy uh, if very well done uh, uh, in considering the challenge with low z values of imaging uh, then it is possible to directly observe the formation of these micelles liposomes or spherulitic uh, features by uh, tem 
transmission electron microscopy. Now here, let's talk about polymers in general. Polymers in general uh, are considered nanomaterials in the sense that they can form objects, films, or interfaces in the nanoscale regime. So for example, orientation of single chains at a surface or interface results in orientation leading to um, brush uh, copolymer systems or nanostructured films or even membrane-like structures with cross-linking. On the other hand, a polymer is also a true surfactant or a true colloidal material in that they can complex, interact with other colloids, they can form flickering emulsions, cross-link, form core shell particles, and thus uh, they play an important role in colloidal phenomena. Actually, stimuli-responsive polymers or uh, polymer, black copolymer, amphiphilic surfactants can show a variety of stimuli-responsive properties uh, in a solution as a function of temperature, salt condition, uh, interface between two liquids such as oil and water, uh, the presence of salts, uh, as well as complexation. So as you can see here, a black copolymer amphiphile or a mixed uh, amphiphilic polymer or grafted polymers and particles uh, can have various micellar, nanogel, core shell particle, uh, phenomena, or even Janus particle-like properties. Uh, that's because a polymer essentially represents a very large uh, surfactant. A di-block of polymer where phase A and phase B are immiscible or have a big difference in the chi interaction parameter can act as a very stable surfactant. So unlike small molecule surfactants, uh, these uh, micelles uh, form very stable phases as well as uh, liquid crystalline structure as in a variety of compositions. Are they real? Yes, they are. As you can see here, uh, a term which is called black copolymer vesicle uh, can also be called polymerosomes are actually visible with transmission electron microscopy. As you can see here, a variety of structures like globular, fibrous-like, uh, spherical can be observed, let's say, with a black or polybutadiene and polyethylene oxide. And uh, the region between what we call liposomes, which is a, a double a layer region to polymerosomes, really is a function of molecular weight. That is higher molecular weight uh, even or longer chains tend to give you very stable vesicles or polymerosomes. Uh, here you see again various transmission electron microscopy uh, of different uh, particles, uh, latex particles or yeah, emulsions uh, uh, of stabilized systems with black polymers as your uh, polymeric uh, surfactant. Actually combining, let's say, black polymers and nanoparticles, you can form these core shell particles or even nanoreactors where the particle is hosted inside the core of these uh, structures or carbon nanotube as well. And as you can see here, essentially the polymer, black polymer is a good compatibilizer that protects the inside or the outside of the matrix and the um, particle that is being compatibilized with that matrix. So I think it's a better uh, introduction or a good point to start talking about colloids. So colloids essentially is a substance with component uh, present in one or two phases. It's more appropriately uh, referred to uh, materials that are particulate in nature, uh, ranging from one nanometer to a thousand nanometers in diameter. Uh, other types of colloidal phenomena is influenced by surface chemistry, density, presence of uh, compatibilizers, as well as diffusion or sedimentation kinetics. So very familiar substances to you include butter, milk, aerosol, asphalt, ink, paints, glues, etc. These are colloidal dispersions in the sense that uh, different uh, 
components are suspended and stabilized within these different media, uh, including uh, liquid or air. So colloids essentially is a dimension uh, that is not sometimes appreciated compared to bulk, solid, air, or liquid, in that suspensions, solutions, and colloids play around whenever you have variations in size of the molecule aggregation phenomena or the influence of gravity. As mentioned, colloids, uh, the way to look at them are, are objects or uh, different types of uh, uh, materials or particles with the size range of one to a thousand nanometers even. Uh, thus, the reduction of the uh, scale to particulate in nature results in a very high surface to volume advantage. So you can say that any particular uh, reaction or phenomena or product where you can realize the uh, advantages based on surface to volume ratio increase by converting it to particles or colloidal particles is one of the important applications of uh, mastering or understanding colloidal phenomena. Uh, again, here you can see uh, different types of representation of these colloidal systems. So basically, the high surface to volume advantage is taken by reducing a bulk material to a particle. And at the same time, uh, one of the biggest challenges is aggregation phenomena. That is, colloids' main advantage is basically that high surface. Once you have aggregation between colloids, then you lose that advantage. Okay, so classification, a colloid, depending on the continuous phase or dispersed medium, has different terms. So for example, if you have a gas as a continuous medium, this would represent aerosols. So liquid or solid aerosols, for example, fog, mist, air spray are liquid aerosols. On the other hand, smoke uh, in air is a particulate or solid aerosol. If the continuous medium is a liquid and the gas phase is your dispersed medium, that's cream. If you have a liquid, liquid, continuous, and dispersed phase, that will be things like milk, mayonnaise. And then if you have a solid and uh, medium and liquid me continuous medium, that will be things like paint, uh, ink, etc. And then, of course, you have solid uh, to gas, liquid, solid uh, type of uh, uh, classification. Now, let's talk about zeta potential and, and another important uh, property other than the surface area uh, that needs to be specified. Zeta potential is, is due to the presence of a diffuse bilayer that tends to neutralize a surface that is charged. That is, you have electrostatic interaction being a very important uh, parameter uh, that uh, is used to control the stability of colloids. So zeta potential, and I don't think I'll have a chance to show how an instrument looks like, basically gives you the value of the charge of the particle. Uh, other types of colligative properties, including flocculation, uh, different types of sedimentation, coagulation, uh, is a function of uh, this interaction between colloidal particles due to, let's say, par uh, charge repulsion or charge uh, attraction. And uh, not only uh, the elect presence of electrostatic uh, or surf surface potential effects, but also hysteric behavior, as you'll see later, affected by the presence of uh, volume or alkyl chain, for example, that uh, uh, prevents it, the particles from coming into very close contact. So here we see the uh, progression of a stable system to a phase-separated system. Uh, essentially, if you have uh, flocculation, coagulation, and finally sedimentation, uh, these are terms that are used to specify uh, phase separation. So the most stable, for example, will be a totally repulsed or oppositely or similarly charged particle that hate, 
each other in terms of aggregation. And then a stable phase separation is when you have aggregation and let's say the effect of gravity leading towards complete phase separation. Uh, now polymer are, can be formed as colloids. Uh, one way to do this is of course to form particles by emulsion polymerization. So for example, in a method called emulsion polymerization where you have the monomer uh, initiator and a surfactant allowing you to form a stable emulsion. The polymer then grows inside a micelle that is formed in that uh, latex uh, particle emulsion such that the depletion of all the monomers eventually uh, leading towards the formation of polymer particles uh, initially hosted by the micelle uh, is termed as emulsion polymerization or latex polymerization. Okay. So I may have to skip this uh, part uh, because of time reasons. Uh, essentially, what you have uh, between a particle and its environment or in a multi-phase behavior is a representation of factors like excluded volume, electrostatic interaction, entropic forces, steric forces, and other van der Waal forces. The, these forces then determine the stability of those colloids. So stabilization essentially can be done by uh, uh, the presence of steric constraints or, or electrostatic constraints. These are the two main methods of controlling uh, colloidal dispersion or stability of colloids over time. That is uh, when formulating or preparing a product uh, usually taking into account steric or electrostatic stabilization methods allows for a longer shelf life. Okay, so as pictorially shown here, you have particles uh, in a colloid. Uh, in the left at A, you have a lot of aggregation because of charge attraction. On the other hand, similarly charged particles tend to hate each other and therefore separate. Uh, the bottom picture shows the presence of steric stabilization. So let's say the grafting of polymers on a particle can result in a volume occupancy that results further enroachment or attraction between particles simply because a volume of alkyl chain length or polymer uh, exists between those two particles preventing close interaction. Um, unfortunately, we will not have time to uh, go over adhesion theory, except that adhesion, of course, uh, very much uh, refers to the interaction between two dissimilar surfaces, thus governing wetting, and as we covered earlier, the Young's equation. But uh, there are other types of uh, things that can affect adhesion, uh, which is what is used for, this, let's say, designing adhesives. That is, you can have mechanical, you can have diffusion, you can have chemical uh, factors that can improve adhesion uh, between surfaces or the action of adhesives uh, in bonding or, or uh, binding to uh, surfaces. For example, your super glue, epoxy glue, and other types of pressure sensitive type of uh, uh, applications such as in labels. Now, let me jump quickly. Uh, to what we, uh, topic what which we call Langmuir Blodgett films. So if you take a surfactant, a very small amount, and then drop it on water, that surfactant will tend to spread at the interface and thus affecting the surface tension. Uh, moreover, the concentration a concentration exists that you can have what we call complete monolayer coverage or the formation of a crystal layer. Uh, such as the layer of a surfactant. That type of phenomena can be observed using what we call a langmuir blodgett trap or langmuir blodgett experiment. As shown here, the concentration of the uh, um, molecule or surfactant or what we call area per molecule will decrease as you pack this uh, materials or surfactants closer and closer to each other. Thus, you can assign uh, three phases um, with this monolayer packing ranging from grass, 
to liquid, to liquid expanded, to solid or condensed phase. And the shape of this isotherm, because it's measured in one temperature, uh, can give you a lot of interpretation in terms of the packing behavior and the orientation of the surfactant at the air-water interface. So as shown here, a langmuir blodgett device uh, where you have a Wilhelmy plate balance to measure the surface tension and a substrate that's dipped in and out of the water, capturing a monolayer or by successive dipping results in multi-layers, which can be termed X, Y, or Z type. Unfortunately, I'll not, I won't have time here to discuss about self-assembled monolayer, a type of uh, uh, chemisorption or physisorption on a surface res resulting as well in a single layer and is done in a bulk phase. Uh, another topic that I will not have an opportunity to uh, discuss are what we call layer by layer uh, electrolyte or uh, amphiphilic interaction that also results in multi-layer uh, formation via chemical adsorption or physical adsorption. So let's move now to detergent C or detergent, since this is probably more related to everyday things. So a detergent is usually not a single uh, chemical or molecule composition. It is usually a formulation. So that's the easiest part to remember. When you buy a detergent to wash your clothes or uh, to clean, it's usually made up of many ingredients. So to begin with, it's made up of surfactants, which then uh, is important for detergency as well as uh, uh, emulsification. And again, this can be classified as anionic, cationic, neutral. So a particular detergent, for example, can have many types of surfactants that helps it deal with different types of water or the presence of salts or oils and water. Uh, there are ingredients that are called builders, um, which is a second component that tends to, let's say, deactivate uh, calcium and ions responsible for hard, hard water. So they tend to chelate them, for example, trifol, uh, uh, polyphosphates or EDTA or nitrile, nitrile acetic acid. They tend to uh, capture or remove calcium ions and therefore decrease the amount of uh, the white precipitate uh, or the precipitation of those salts um, together with the surfactant. Fillers and processing aid, bleaches, which is an oxidizing mechanism, uh, they tend to improve the whiteness or brightness of a particular detergency procedure. Fluorescers, enzymes, fabric softener or neutralizers. Uh, others would be anti-foaming agents, corrosion inhibitor, uh, colorants, and fragrances. So all, all of these things make for a better formulated product, whether we are referring to a dishwashing detergent, a clothes detergent, or even uh, other types of cleaning agents. Uh, here you can see the different types of uh, surfactants and their liposome or uh, different types of uh, um, liquid detergency stages uh, representing the action of surfactants and the other um, formulated ingredients to making for an effective uh, cleaning um, product. Now, polymer to surfactant interaction. So, it suffice to say that the process of polymer tends to stabilize interactions or prolong stabilization. So the presence of polymer chains in a micelle, for example, means that a polymeric surfactant will form a stable micelle compared to a small molecule surfactant or different types of aggregation or stabilization phenomena can result in better interaction. Uh, so here uh, you, you see the changes in concentration as far as surface tension uh, relationships. So surface tension tends to decrease. The critical micelle concentration tends to decrease in the presence of polymers. And pictorially, you can see here that polymers 
promote aggregation or micellar formation in smaller molecules for pacta. Uh, here again, you see the type of interaction, let's say with the presence of side groups uh, that tend to promote uh, hydrophobic or hydrophilic interactions and thus anchoring of micelles, let's say on a polymer backbone. And here is another uh, extreme uh, uh, structure where you see surfactants forming bilayers they separated with their corresponding block of polymer host and higher aggregated structures, uh, including columnar phases, that can be uh, catalyzed or, or um, promoted by the presence of polymers and surfactants together. Okay. Uh, here you can see uh, uh, different phases uh, that are formed uh, in the presence of concentration and the ability of a surfactant to be bound to a polymer. Okay, so I, I don't think I'll have time uh, to show all the different examples. And unfortunately, I, I'd like to uh, uh, complete this in one hour. But let me finish by showing uh, interesting examples or applications of control on surface phenomena and colloids. So in my group, for example, we specialize in what we call grafting of polymer brushes. So grafting of polymer brushes involves anchoring an initiator, anchoring an existing polymer, or using a surface loaded with polymers to polymerize through the surface. Uh, we've done this a lot on a, a variety of substrates, you know, from silicon wafer to layer by layer films to different types of nanoparticles. So the important thing here is that by adding or tethering a polymer on a surface, you tend to uh, improve its compatibilization behavior, its wetting properties, and the interaction between the surface and the um, majority holes between the substrate surface, whether it's a solid uh, film or a particle film, uh, particle uh, substrate. So here, for example, it shows how a particle can be uh, stabilized or coated or form a core shell structure simply by tethering initiators on a surface and doing what we call a surface initiated polymer approach to form brushes on particles representing that of a, um, um, a modified particle. Okay that can uh, be dispersed very well on a uh, similar phase uh, matrix. For example, we have used this to modify graphene oxide by grafting initiators based on uh, ATRP or raft, and then the subsequent polymerization uh, results in core shell particles of graphene oxide with polymer brush coatings, which then uh, we have used to compatibilize or change the viscosity properties of fluids based on a modified graphene oxide. Um, with the remaining time, uh, let me show you other examples uh, of where surface phenomena is important. In the wetting behavior of a surface, I explained very early on what a Cassie-Baxter and a Wenzel approach does uh, in comparison to a simpler um, Young's equation. So in this case, uh, we see on this uh, paper uh, lithographically formed um, structures of, on silicon wafer, uh, in fact, uh, quite ordered, whether it's cubic, hexagonal, and then by modifying also their uh, surface energy of the top of those uh, uh, structures, one can investigate uh, clearly the effect of wetting on various uh, factors such as the roughness, the volume of trapped air, and the surface energy of the surface. Uh, the result essentially is a very clean study on the Cassie-Baxter and Wenzel differentiation, which are model surfaces as shown here. And uh, in fact, the contact angle, the surface energy, can be quantitatively measured uh, by doing this series of experiments to 
elucidate the effect of each factor on changing the uh, contact angle. The value of 150 or more, for example, is taken as a super hydrophobic film or wetting behavior that is manifested or measured by uh, these contact angle measurements. Uh, here uh, is an example of the preparation and characterization of a complex micelle based on a, uh, a thermosensitive uh, surfactant or black of polymer surfactant where the formation of micelles can be observed, let's say, uh, by uh, TEM or other types of uh, micellization phenomena. So these polymers, for example, uh, were synthesized by cationic polymerization uh, or ring opening polymerization uh, of oxacidines. Now using techniques like TEM or uh, dynamic light scattering, uh, one can observe these micelles directly as shown here. Moreover, the thermosensitive nature means that based on temperature, you can see this micelle contract or swell uh, because of the interaction between the oxazoline polymer uh, block. Uh, here, uh, we have uh, a experiment or a report showing the de different degrees of protonation uh, and the effect on the aggregation and phase behavior of a double chain surfactant, uh, representing the formation of various uh, interesting uh, opalescent like behavior or virifringent phases. Now, these uh, uh, vesicles can be unilamellar or multilamellar. Again, using TEM, the authors were able to uh, isolate uh, and describe and uh, show the exact vesicular structure as one changes the uh, concentration uh, of these various surfactants. Okay. Uh, fourth example, uh, and I think I'll end with this one, uh, we have an experiment where a black copolymer was investigated uh, in terms of their behavior at the air-water interface and related to their architecture or topological uh, design. So in a series based on polyethylene oxide and polybutadiene dye blocks and star black copolymer, uh, each of these uh, black copolymer was investigated at the air-water interface and characterize uh, in terms of their Langmuir blodgett film behavior. And as you can see here, this polybutadiene polyethylene oxide block, uh, depending on the uh, volume ratio or composition ratio between these blocks, have various types of condensed liquid expanded liquid phase behavior uh, or area occupied at the air water interface uh, with a surface pressure area isotherm. And of course, Imaging like atomic force microscopy, uh, for example, allows one to reveal the um, aggregation behavior and the uh, vesicular formation as, I, as observed at the air-water interface. And uh, for example, uh, the use of a silane group on one of the blocks, the polybutadiene, enables one to cross-link and stabilize these structures at the air water interface because water promotes the uh, siloxane cross linking units uh, once they are deposited at the air water interface. Okay, so I think I'm done here. And as I said, I did not mean to cover everything uh, with regards to surface and colloidal phenomena, but I hope this has been a fruitful lecture for you to get you started and to get you curious with the importance of this science in everyday things. So with that, I'd like to thank you and I'd be happy to turn over again at the table to Gerald.